Let's open our Bibles to John chapter 21. We're continuing our study in Matthew. We're wrapping this up. We're a couple of weeks away from uh, finishing the book of Matthew. As we have been doing for the last nine years, we're taking a lot of time to cross-reference and look at other pieces of Scripture that help fill in the blanks that we would otherwise miss out on in the book of Matthew. And uh, in this case, this particular gospel account has a story that we don't find uh, in the Gospel of Matthew, but it is a post-resurrection experience that the disciples had with Jesus. It's also kind of interesting because it seems to tag itself onto the Gospel of John itself. Uh, in the earlier chapter, uh, chapter 20, it almost seems like John is finished and he gives sort of a benediction. Uh, but then he adds this latter third of physical a visible resurrection experience that seven of these disciples had with the Lord. Uh, let's go before the Lord today in prayer as we begin. Lord, thank you for the opportunities that we have to study the Bible. And Lord, I thank you for the help that you've given me today uh, that I'm able to be here and uh, for continued recovery. I thank you for that, Lord. I do pray today as we... Now, ponder the scripture as we don't just read through it, but that we dig deep, we think about what you're doing and how you're wanting to communicate with all of us, not just looking at a historical account, but how you minister to our needs uh, through these things, Lord. We do ask that you would do great things in our hearts today. We give you praise in Jesus' name, amen. So, Jesus has been crucified. Jesus was buried for three days and three nights. Jesus has risen from the dead. We are looking at the post-resurrection experiences that the disciples had with the Lord in his physically resurrected body. And uh, trying to learn from those things that the Lord would have us um, to, to grow through as a result of this study And today's lesson, in my opinion, is one of the valuable lessons in the Bible. Uh, It is certainly valuable to me. And you'll see why as we develop this. You guys will remember that after Jesus had been resurrected from the dead, he mentioned to have words sent to his disciples and Peter that he would meet them in Galilee or the Galilee region. And um, it was specific that he said, and Peter, because Peter had denied the Lord three times uh, prior to his crucifixion, and no doubt would have felt like, you know what, Um, he's done with me, he wouldn't want me there. Uh, But he says, go and tell my disciples and Peter that I go before them, I'll meet them in Galilee. And uh, that is such an encouragement to Peter. And of course, Peter is there and does get to see the Lord in his resurrected body and in his resurrected power. Peter would have otherwise been extremely discouraged and needed encouragement. It turns out that even though Jesus rose from the dead, even though Jesus appeared to Peter, even though Jesus appeared to Peter and uh, called him specifically by name to that appearance, it seems as though he was still discouraged. Why? What's going on? It's interesting to me the behavior of Peter. Uh, He is so much like me in so many ways, or shall I say I'm so much like him. Uh, Maybe you, too, are a little bit like Peter. Uh, I I see myself in all the disciples, uh, depending on the scenarios. Uh, And... To be able to look at this and to say, man, how could he possibly be discouraged still? What's going on with him? Uh, Why would he uh, do what he's going to be doing, as we'll see in the text? Uh, Well, it reminds me of the fact that there are many times in ministry that people become discouraged, uh, especially those that are engaged in full-time ministry. And I suspect that the Lord placed this story not only to give us an insight of how he encouraged Peter, but also that he would bring encouragement to you and to me when we're engaged in ministry. 
I already mentioned to you over the last two Sundays that God has put in the church apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers for the perfecting of the saints for the work of the ministry. And so God wants everybody to be engaged in ministry, whether it is by profession and you're a pastor in a church or uh, some other officer or some particular office that you fill in a church setting or whether you are uh, employed otherwise and simply engaged in ministry as God has gifted you, uh, whatever the case may be, God has a plan for all of us in ministry. And if all of us are called into the ministry, there will be times that all of us will be discouraged in the ministry. But in particular, in this case, the disciples are, for whatever reason that we will have to make some assumptions concerning, uh, are discouraged even after seeing Jesus resurrected from the dead, even though they have already had a meal with him, even though they have uh, seen Thomas touch him in his hands. And uh, they, they are very aware of the, the power of his resurrection. Um, they decide to return to their old life, their old ways. That's what's happening here. Uh, Peter says, I'm going to go fishing. And six of the other disciples say, we're going to go with you. That's a mind blower to me. Well, they had been with Jesus day in, day out, literally, uh, nearly 24-7 for three years. They watched all the miracles. They saw the, the, the blind eyes opened. They saw the lame walk. They saw people that were bound by demons delivered. And in, in, the, in the midst of that kind of powerful experience, uh, all of a sudden, now, Jesus is gone. Even though he's resurrected, even though they knew he was resurrected, he wasn't with them. Uh, there were increments. At one point, there was a, a space of a whole week that they didn't see him. And uh, this was after his resurrection. So he, sh he shows up on a Sunday, and then he shows up again uh, the next Sunday. And so, of course, they're very encouraged when he shows up, when he is there with them. Uh, because they would think, well, you know, when he's not here, he's not here. Uh, but that isn't the case. Uh, you have heard the expression, many of you have heard the expression, God showed up. Uh, in churching today, you know, we have this emotionalism, uh, you know, where people come to church and they're having this wonderful experience in the Lord, whether it's a part of the music time or a prayer time or whatever it is, uh, all of a sudden something very miraculous seems to happen and people say, well, God showed up. I always challenge that because, you know, God is never absent. He is omnipresent. He's always present, and we need to be aware of that. It's that we say God shows up when God shows up the way we want him to. And God doesn't always show up the way we want him to. God does what he wants. He's sovereign, and he's at work all the time. I have seen churches, literally, that had revivals that were amazing, uh, where many, many people were being challenged by the Lord, and many people came to know the Lord. Uh, this goes on in church history uh, over the 2,000 years plus of church history where we've seen tremendous works of God in various pockets around the world, some of which have happened as close to uh, us as uh, in places like Southern California and, uh, well, Toronto, Canada. People talk about, you know, God showed up and the Toronto blessing happened in Brownsville, uh, Florida, the Brownsville Revival, and they're talking about God showing up. Some of these things would be, we would attribute to the Lord, and some things we would attribute to the works of the flesh. But the point is, when these kinds of activities are going on, people get very excited about the things of God, and it, when they stop, many people get discouraged and abandon their faith. They just say, forget it, I'm done, I'm over. it's over for me. Uh, you know, God's no longer here. He's not with us. He's not uh, providing all these wonderful miracles and all the stuff that people think is God showing up. And they, they abandon uh, their project. They abandon their call. They abandon the faith sometimes, even many, uh, the, by way of profession at the very least. And so we've seen it. Uh, we, I've seen personally where churches had these tremendous activities and these ministries that were very fruitful and from all of man's uh, perspective were very successful and all of a sudden things sort of, did dry up, sort of dried up and, and the ministers become so discouraged that they just say, forget it, and I'm done. And they, a lot of them just walk away. Marriages have failed, all kinds of things because the excitement, all the stuff that they see that they think is God 
uh, showing up, whether it is or isn't, uh, they put all of their focus on all of those things that they see and their experiential life instead of what they know and what their calling is. And that is really important to the ministry. Churches can have ebbs and flows, churches that explode and have these tremendous moments of growth, and then they hit a plateau, and every church does, every church. Uh, church fads change, you know that, you know, one church will be the new church on, in town, and they, they grow like crazy. Every one of those churches, and no matter what you look at, candlelight included, has its day when it does some growing, and then it has a place where it will kind of plateau. Uh, we always are saying, God, it's not our church, it's your church, it's not our ministry, it's your ministry. Do what you want to do with it, and we're going to be faithful to the call. But in the same way, because we're human, because we're frail, we do struggle with our human emotions. We struggle with, you know, is this successful? How many people are coming? Is the finances okay? Are lots of people getting saved? You know, guys... God is in charge of the number of people that show up. God is in charge of the number of people that get saved. God is in charge of the amount of finances that comes in. Our job is faithfulness to God. And it's his working in us, and as we are living our lives and surrender to him, that he is working in us. And as we are simply walking in the obedience to the call that God has given us, that God will measure success and we can just trust him. And believe me, when that kind of faith is in you, all the turmoil of the topsy-turvy and roller coaster ride of emotional Christianity will come to an end. And you will be a person living in peace, trusting the sovereignty of God as he's at work. Now, all that to be said, let's read from the Bible. Verse one. Now, after... These things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias. Uh, the Sea of Tiberias is also known as the Sea of Galilee or the Lake of Galilee, sometimes referred to as just the Galilee, depending on the context and also who's writing, who's communicating. If you go to Israel today, uh, they'll just talk about the Galilee as a region. They'll also talk about the Lake of Galilee. Uh, and, and so you have all these uh, overarching uh, nomenclatures that are used in communication to the Sea of Galilee, as you're most familiar with it in the Bible. And so he went to, to show himself to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. And so if you're doing the math, it's seven disciples altogether. Now Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. And they said to him, we are going with you also. And they went out immediately and got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. And so Peter, post-resurrection, post-visible recognition of the resurrection, uh, post-commission, the, the great commission that we've been studying now the last two weeks has already been communicated. Go into all the world and preach the gospel. We read in one gospel. Go into all the world and make disciples. We read in another. We've covered this the last two weeks. And so Peter has been given a commission to go with the gospel. I mentioned to you already uh, in, from Keith Green's song, uh, Jesus Commands Us to Go, uh, the added uh, uh, phrase that Keith puts into the song is, but we go the other way. Well, in this case, Peter is doing that. He is not going as he has been told. He seems to be discouraged. Something has derailed him. And so he says, look, I'm going the other way. I'm going to go fishing. Now, if you're careful in your Bible study, you will remember that in the Gospel of Matthew and in the Gospel of Luke, we know about the calling of Peter, a brother of Andrew. Remember the communications, we found the Messiah and so forth, but the Lord directly calls him from a fishing boat. There was an occasion, if you want to review it later, it's in Matthew ch or, uh, Luke chapter five, where the disciple Peter was out fishing all night long. And after fishing all night long, he had caught nothing. And the Lord gives him a commission, uh, and in the commission and the obedience of Peter, he gathers in a number of fish at the very last moment uh, by a miraculous work of God. And it, the, the amount of fish that were brought in were so great that the nets themselves began to tear away. 
And so uh, that's the way Peter is introduced to the Lord in a personal sense. And from that, he says, henceforth, you will be a fisher of men. And so he has called Peter from that moment, leave your nets and follow me. Now, three years later, Peter says, I'm going fishing. That was a direct contradiction to what the Lord had already said, from henceforth, you will be fishers of men. I'm going back to my old self. I'm going back to my old life. I'm going back to my old ways. I'm going to do it the way I know how to do it on my own. And the Lord never called him to do that. But to the contrary, he said, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Go into all the world and make disciples. But no, not Peter and six of the others that joined him. And so they go out and they were fishing all night long and they caught nothing again. Interesting. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore And yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Now, next week or the week after, depending on where this falls in, we'll talk a little bit about the way the Lord kind of concealed his identity for a purpose at times from people. We talked about that when we spoke about the disciples on the road to Emmaus. But um, in this case, maybe it was just foggy. Maybe it was still a little dark. Maybe they could just see the silhouette. You know, we don't know. But whatever it was at the moment, they did not know that it was the Lord. And then Jesus said to them, children, have you any food or any meat, if you're reading the King James? Uh, And they answered and said, no. Now, this is probably something that I'm going to develop a little bit, and and you'll always need to be careful whenever I throw in my two bits, because, you know, I like to extrapolate things out of the scripture. Mostly, I would say truth, and sometimes I tell you, well, it's my fabrication, and so uh, let's just go with my fabrication for today, at least on some of this. Uh, I don't know. If if you're a fisherman, I'm not. Uh, I'm not a hunter. I'm not a fisherman. I eat fish. I eat game, uh, but I let you men, the real men, go do it (laughs) and tithe of your spoils. Uh, You know, thank you, Lord. Uh, uh, something about putting a hook through a worm just makes me creep out, you know, I don't know, I, I'm a sissy man, you know, I don't have all that uh, machismo that you, you guys have, uh, but anyway, uh, if you're a fisherman, you know the drill, if you go out fishing and you see somebody else out there fishing, you say, hey, how's it going, and you know, if a guy's ca- catching fish, oh, got a great one, and fishermen are t- notorious liars, oh, you should have seen the one that w- got away, you know, that kind of thing. Uh, But if you've been out there fishing all day long and you've got nothing, that's sort of a discouraging question to have to answer. How's it going? We've been fishing all night. How are you guys doing? Did you get anything? No. Now, I don't know about you, but Peter would be like the notoriously great fisherman. This was his profession before this three-year venture with the Lord. And so he decides, I'm going back to my old life, and they go out fishing all night long. And how are you guys doing? Now, I love the sense of humor of the Lord. Because this, we see this all the way through the scriptures. You know, back in the garden when they hid themselves. Adam, where are you guys? Where are you guys at? Uh, he knew, you know. Who told you you were naked? I mean, all the, you, you got, he has this wonderfully crazy, cool sense of humor. And so I already know that God already knows that they didn't catch any fish. You guys got anything? I mean, that's just funny to me. And so... He knows he's kind of getting at him a little bit, you know? No, you can see it already. And so the Lord says to him, "Uh, cast your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. And they cast, and now they were not able to draw in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore, that disciple who uh, Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord now, the disciple who Jesus, uh, who Jesus loved is John. John never names himself in the first person. He always kind of hides behind that third person uh, phraseology, the disciple whom Jesus loved, which I, I personally love that, you know, just to feel that kind of love from the Lord. And John articulates that for us. And so he says, it's the Lord. Now, before this, of course, they didn't know it was the Lord, and now they know it's the Lord. And so they, they say, uh, Well, it's the Lord because of the miracle, because of the amazing amount of fish. It's got to be God. And so, yay, uh, God's here again. 
And I love that. Uh, you know, and it was the Lord. And he did provide them a great blessing. And there's a purpose behind that blessing that God will uh, carry out for us in this great drought of fish that they, they pull in. So many that they had to get extra help. They, they're, you guys are pulling this thing in. They could barely get it in to shore. And so at this time, the, the disciple whom uh, Jesus loved says to Peter, it's the Lord. Now, when Simon Peter heard that, it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment for he'd removed it and he jumped into the sea. Now, what in the heck is he thinking? You don't put your clothes on to go swimming. You take them off, right? So Peter, in the midst of the night, I mean, all night long, can you imagine? They're casting the net, they're pulling it in, casting the net, pulling it in. And they're exhausted, they're tired, it's been a whole night venture of frustration and it must have been a warm evening, and there he is out there, and he's down to his skivvies. You know, he's just he's got the little outer waist garment on, and not the cloak that they would wear over it. And so they, uh, John says, well, it's the Lord. And Peter immediately does what every known fisherman would do, puts his clothes on and jumps into the water. I mean, what is that, right? Well, here's my, again, Paul Venno heresy edition, okay, uh, the, the idea here is that uh, I suspect, I suspect, okay, that Peter was embarrassed. Because, see, it's, have you any food? There's the kind of rhetorical question. Uh, no. Uh, now, uh, uh-oh, it's the Lord. Now, Peter knew he was supposed to be doing something, and that wasn't it. I don't know about you, but have you ever been in a situation where you got caught doing something you're not supposed to do? What do you immediately try to do? Cover yourself. You, you try to hide. You try to, to, to make yourself in some way smaller, invisible, or whatever. And in this case, it seems to me that that's what's going on with Peter. He's like, oh, no, I'm busted. I'm supposed to be out preaching the gospel. I'm supposed to be out discipling the nations. And here I've returned to my old trade, discouraged, and the Lord has seen me. He caught me. I'm here doing this very thing right now. And it's the Lord. Oh, no. And so he throws on his clothes and jumps into the water. Would you do that? Yeah, you probably would. You know? I don't know. Uh, we do tr tend to try to hide from the Lord. Uh, now, here's the problem. What's he going to do? stay out there treading water the rest of the morning and hope the Lord doesn't see him, you know, he's going to, no, what, you, you can't get back in the boat. And so what's he going to do? He's going to swim to shore, which he has no choice but to do, and there meet the Lord. Listen. Now, verse 8 says, the other disciple came in from the little boat, uh, and for they were not far from the land, they were about 200 cubits dragging the net with fish. 200 cubits is about 100 yards, so about 300 feet. Uh, out into the, it's a bit of a swim, uh, with a cloak on. And as soon as uh, they had come there to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish laid on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Now, somebody asked me this about three or four weeks ago when we were talking about the physical resurrection. If we, they asked, will we eat in our resurrected bodies? Uh, Jesus ate in his resurrected bodies, and we know that we will. During the millennial reign, uh, we will be in resurrected physical bodies, and we will have the marriage supper of the Lamb on the earth during the millennium, at, the, at least at the very beginning of the millennium. Who knows? It may last the whole thousand years. Uh, there's a lot to be said about that. But we do know this, that there on the seashore is a fire and coals and some fish laying on it and bread. And again, I just I marvel at the Lord. It's the middle of the night. He knows what's going to happen. He knows he's going to sneak up on these guys. They're not going to recognize him right away. They're out there fishing all seven of these guys. They're supposed to be doing something else. And he sneaks up. And I, I mean, I just love how God is. He's just cool, man. You know, I, I, just like Jesus in the tomb after he rose from the dead, you know, remember I told you guys, he, he's in there by himself, and he's like, <laughs> you know, before he rolls away the stone or anything, you know, just how cool is that? that he, he's conscious and thinking this through, and he sneaks out there to the sea, and he builds a fire, you know, and he's thinking, <laughs> boy, these guys are in for a lesson today. I, I love that. Don't you? Do you think God ever thinks about you like that? I'm going to teach him a lesson. It's going to be wonderful. I know God thinks that way. 
Because see, he sees the end from the beginning, and he, he works out things in our hearts and in our lives for his purpose. And so there they've got the fish, and they've got the fire and the bread, and, uh, and he says uh, to them, uh, uh, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. And so Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Now, before we go further on that, let me just tell you, uh, I have heard and read every commentary imaginable on what in the heck does 153 mean. Uh, even this last trip to Israel, our tour guide came up with something. It was all nonsense. Um, the Bible doesn't tell you what the 153 is. And so in order for you to develop something, it's just a fabrication that you try to come up with. And you guys know I'm a numbers guy. So if I see numbers in the Bible, I know that numbers in the Bible have meaning. And so, of course, I'm going to do some homework on it myself. Okay, well, 153 times 7, 153 divided by 7. You know, how does this all work out? It doesn't. And so people can fabricate whatever they want. Uh, I don't think it has any sort of mystical meaning. Uh, I do think it has a meaning and a purpose, and I'll show you in a minute what I think that is. And so they, he says, bring some of the fish, and there's 153 of them in this huge net, but the net's not broken. And then Jesus says to them, come and eat breakfast. And yet none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you, knowing that it was the Lord? Now, by this time, they know it's the Lord. They see him. Uh, they're on the shore with him. Um, the, the miraculous strata fish that have come in, uh, and now he says to them, hey, let's, let's have some fellowship. I like that. See, he, he doesn't condemn them. He just says, hey, how you guys doing? And then he says, well, let's you know, bring some of the fish and let's, let's have breakfast together. I love that about the Lord. He wants to have fellowship with us no matter where we are. You know, a lot of times people talk about being out of fellowship with God. If you're out of fellowship with God, it's because you moved and not him. If you're out of fellowship with God, it's because you don't want to talk to him. It's not because he doesn't want to talk to you. Do you know that? Let that settle in for a minute. God doesn't turn his back on you. He's never fed up with you. He has never had enough of you. He loves you in spite of you. He wants to encourage you. He wants to have fellowship with you. Even in the midst of your difficulties, I'm not saying he wants you to have those difficulties or stay in those difficulties. He will tell Peter, I don't want you to be where you are. I want you to do what I told you to do. But he doesn't condemn him. He says, come, let's have some fellowship together. I love that about the Lord. Let's have breakfast. Well, the disciples didn't say, who are you? knowing that it was the Lord. Well, then came, uh, Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. Now, this is the third time that Jesus showed himself to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. And so this third occasion, as we've been studying these post-resurrection experiences, he gives them the fish. He gives them the bread. He provides for their needs. He pro provides them fellowship. He cares. Now, when they had eaten bread, uh, the breakfast, verse 15, Jesus says to Simon Peter, and remember there's six other disciples there too, but he's on Peter again, because Peter's the instigator in this case. He says, I'm going fishing. The other guy says, yeah, we're going too. And so he says, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And he said to them, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said, feed my lambs. Now, there's too much in that. I'm going to give you some. First of all, if your Bible says Simon, son of John, that's not inappropriate. If your Bible says Simon, son of Jonas, it's not inappropriate. Uh, the Texas Receptus, which I prefer, um, says Sina, Simon, son of Jonah or Jonas, not John. I like that. Now, it's not to suggest one is inappropriate, one is wrong, and the other is right. I'm just telling you that I suspect that there's a hidden meaning here. Do you guys know the story of Jonah? Do you know that Jonah was told by God to go and to prophesy to Nineveh, the enemies of Israel? Uh, Nineveh was the capital city of Assyria. And go, I want you to go there and I want you to prophesy. And what did Jonah do? He said, no, I'm going the other way. 
Jesus commanded him to go, and he went the other way. And so I find this kind of subtle, fun, little thing to be appropriate. Now, the historians and the scholars and the experts will we'll leave them to de determine which manuscripts are the better manuscripts. Uh, as I mentioned already, I like the Texas Receptus. But um, in this case, it's almost interesting because he says Simon Peter, Simon Peter, Petros was the name that he gave him in his ministry life, remember that. Petros means a stone. Uh, Petra is a large stone, but he's Petros, a little stone. And, but he calls him Simon. And he says, Simon, son of Jonah. Now, you could trace the history and you could try to figure out in the genealogical record if he's in the bloodline of Jonah and so forth. But I just love the nomenclature because I have a feeling there's this hidden message. Hmm, you're acting like your father. Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape love me? Do you agape me more than these? Agape is the kind of love that God provides. It is not a human love. There's three kinds of love that we are very familiar with in the Bible. Uh, there's actually more words than th just three Greek words for love, but we have three distinct words. One is agape, or agapeo, which is a verb, agape, a noun. Uh, and then you have phileos, which is brotherly love, like the city Philadelphia, Adelphios, uh, 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 brothers in love, phila, uh, phila, or philos. And so you've got um, uh, uh, phileo love, brotherly love, and then you have eros, uh, E-R-O-S. Eros love is erotic love, sexual love. Uh, and this, unfortunately, in our culture is the kind of love that people think of when they think of I love you. Uh, our movies and TV shows and everything in our Harlequin romance books or whatever it is that people use, read, uh, see uh, in our culture, it's all about the erotic. And boy, that person really turns me on. I must love them. Ooh, they gave me really goopy feelings inside, and now I have goosebumps and and all this stuff. And, they, and people have these feelings, and they, these feelings we interpret as love. This is one of the reasons that we do premarriage counseling, because we want to ask somebody, define love and tell me why you want to marry this person. Those are two questions that I always focus in on, and I focus hard. Uh, because most of the answers are going to be something like this. Um, I want to marry him because he makes me feel so pretty. He makes me feel so wonderful. He completes me, or vice versa. When I'm with her, I just have such an overwhelming sense of, Ooh. and, you know, whatever it is, and people get this stuff going on, and they think, well, that's love. Now, what happens when that goopy feeling goes away? And if anybody that's been married for any length of time, you know that the honeymoon phase doesn't last forever. Now, you want to keep working it and keep kindling the, the fire, you know, uh, but as you get older and as you get tireder and as you know each other and you're more familiar, you know, it's not like everything is all driven by the goopy stuff, you know, there's something more and it better grow into phileo and to agape. Now, phileo is the kind of love between uh, brother, sister, 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 brother, brother, uh, and husband and wife. Uh, Brenda is my best friend. There's no question about that. So we have a brotherly love, so to speak, a phileo. Uh, and yet even then, it, there's more than that. It, you have to grow up beyond the phileo into the agape. Agape love is an other-centered kind of love. It is not focused on yourself. Lust focuses on self. Love focuses on others. And when people say, I have fallen out of love with my spouse, what they're really saying is, I have fallen out of lust with my spouse. They no longer serve my needs. They don't make me happy. I'm not Twitter-pated. Uh, you, as a, uh, an individual growing up in the Lord, come to a place where your commitment is to love someone not for your sake, for their sake. So when we do pre-marriage counseling, we're always telling them when, they, when we ask the question, why do you want to marry somebody, we're bringing them back to, you're going to marry them because you're going to serve them. 
you're going to do everything you can to provide for them, to make their life better, to help them grow. Everything that you do in your marriage relationship is so that you can be a benefit to the spouse, not so the spouse can be a benefit to you. And believe me, if both spouses are participating that way, you'll have a wonderful marriage. When one or the other party decides that they're going to start serving themselves, that's when things begin to fall apart. And so in this case, Jesus says to Simon, son of Jonah, do you agape me more than these? Now, the question that comes up, well, what in the heck are these? Fish. Now, again, you put your Van Way heresy filter on because I'm making some assumptions. I don't know. Uh, maybe he was saying, do you love me more than these disciples? I doubt it. I doubt he was going to do that. You know, the, look at these guys. You know, parents, don't compare your kids to each other. Every kid's different, right? And so don't say, you should act like Johnny. Johnny always cleans his room, and you never clean your room. You know, don't do that to your kids. But the thing is, I, I don't see that kind of parenting out of the Lord. So he's not, do you love me more than these disciples? No, I think he's actually saying to them, do you love me more than these fish? Now, that takes us back to why the heck do we have 153, which takes me back to put on your heresy filter again. I suspect that while Jesus said, bring some fish, let's put them on the fire, that these fishermen were so excited about this huge amount of fish, large fish, 153, that Peter probably said to them, hey, guys, uh, let's grab a couple and throw them on the fire, but while I'm doing it... uh, count up what we got. And so, you know, you got one guy over here and one guy over there, and they put him into piles, and one guy's counting his. How many did we get, you guys? And Jesus is sitting there having fellowship with them while they're counting their fish. And so he's, he's aware of the fact that there they are, counting the fish. We got 153. It might have been 155. Maybe they ate a couple and didn't count those. I don't know. But the thing is, they were very concerned to some degree or another, with how much fish they got. That's why it's in the Bible. It's not to try to bring some mystical thing to you. It just simply tells you they cared. They counted them, okay? Do you love me more than these? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo thee. He didn't say I agape thee, or you, sorry, King James brain cells. Um, Peter, do you agape me? And Peter says, Lord, you know that I phileo thee, you. In other words, my love isn't adequate. My love isn't up to par. My emotional commitment isn't where it should be. And you know one of the things that stands up for me right away that I just think is incredible and awesome? He says... To Peter, if you're reading this carefully, in the Greek, it says, then get away from me. I just don't want anything to do with you because you don't love me enough. Does it say that? No, it doesn't say that. He says, feed my lambs. Oh, you guys. You see, God doesn't discourage the discouraged. Peter was discouraged. It's over. God's not here. He left. Yeah, I know he rose from the dead, but man, I'm going to go fishing. I'm I'm going back to my old life. And the Lord shows up and asks him these questions that are probing and, you know, obviously with sense of humor. But when he says to him, Lord, you know that I phileo thee, he doesn't say, go away. That's not good enough for me. He says, feed my lambs. He encourages him in the ministry. Now, the lambs, you might say, well, those are the babies, the younger ones. Okay, we'll we'll allow for that. Um, Feed the younger believer. They're my lambs. Let's see what he does next. He says to him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And again, Jonah uh, is in the King James, New King James. Uh, Do you love me? Do you agape me? And he says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I phileo you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. So first feed my lambs, now tend my sheep. Tending is shepherding. See, it's more than just feeding. 
Anybody can take the bucket of food and lay it out there. But to care for them, to look at the flock, to make sure that they're eating good grass and, and drinking from good streams of water and not uh, polluted water and bad grass. And we talked about this a lot last Sunday, that what it means to be a pastor and what my responsibility is to you in discipling you and making sure that you know the truth, for the truth will set you free and that you can spot error. That's important. So Jesus says to him, in encouragement again, uh, tend, shepherd my sheep. And he says to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you phileo me? For the third time, he doesn't say agape, he says phileo. The Lord speaks down to his level. Do you have affection for me, Peter? Are we friends? Not, you better agape me or else. He says, do you have affection for me, Peter? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you phileo me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I phileo you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Feed them, tend them. My sheep, my lambs, youngest to oldest, Give yourself to giving them the word and then guard them. Protect them like a shepherd, like a sheepdog. Be aware of their needs and tend to my sheep. And the Lord doesn't discourage Peter. He actually encourages him to keep on in the ministry. Guys, I told you at the front end, this sermon probably has more application to me than it has to you but it does have, have application to all of you. I know for sure that there are times in our ministry life when our excitement about the ministry ebbs and flows. There's an old saying, you know, the pastor quits his job every Monday. Uh, I don't quit on Mondays. Usually mine is like Tuesday afternoon or something. I, you know, maybe it takes me longer. Uh, but it's because of the trials of ministry, the difficulties of ministry, uh, you, man, you guys have no idea uh, what it means to be in leadership. Uh, I know uh, that some of you do, uh, some of you that are corporate executives and some of you that are in places of leadership in, in, a, in some corporate structure or uh, in, in any way, if you're a leader, you're going to get shot at. It's going to be costly. It's not f- the feeling of being famous like so many people think. You know, ooh, I want to be the pastor because he's so wonderful and everybody likes him. Don't kid yourself. More people hate him than like him. You know, and and this is a reality. There's costs involved in ministry. And it's the emotional side of ministry is that it's really fun when you feel on fire for God. But what about when you don't feel on fire for God? That's not all that feeling and that touchy-feely stuff, all the emotions. Do you know that we are humans, all of us, and that we have emotions? How many of you have ever woke up in the morning and just the first thing in your heart is the songs of praise on your lips? You're speaking in tongues out loud in your sleep. I mean, you're, you're just all the stuff that, you know, that we would think of as the emotional wor- world of Christianity and just, and I have touch, uh, goosebumps because I think about Jesus. And, oh, man, I'm so excited and I can't wait to get out of bed today because I'm going to go win souls for Christ. And man, you are super emotional. Or then the next day you wake up and you don't even feel like you're saved. You're like, oh, ugh. Why do I have to get up this morning? I hate that dumb lawnmower. Whatever it is that you got going on, you know? And then you go, well, man, I must not be saved because I'm not on fire for God. I'm not emotionally all charged up. God wants us to grow past phileo to agape. Commitment. It's the same thing in your marriage. You know, your marriage has those moments where they're lots of fun. There's those moments when it says, I'm going to be committed to you till death do us part. Amen? And so the Lord doesn't discourage him, and the Lord doesn't discourage us. He doesn't say to us, look, your love is not sufficient. What he says is, I want you to obey me and go do what I told you to do and watch what I do. If you look at the life of Peter and you get down to his epistles and you read the epistles of Peter, it is so very clear that he agapes the Lord. 
The Lord didn't say, go and tell my disciples that I meet them in Galilee. He said, go and tell my disciples and Peter. The Lord didn't look at Peter and say, Lord, uh, Peter, look, I know that you only have this kind of friendship love, and therefore I'm not going to be able to use you in ministry. No, he says, I want you to grow, and I'm going to be the one to grow you. For it is God who is at work in you both to will and to do for his good pleasure. And so God is working in the life of the person as they are serving the Lord, as they're walking in obedience to the Lord. And guys, I can tell you firsthand, ministry is tough. Now in the first service, our young pastors were in the room. Now they're out busy doing their ministries. And uh, I, I, I spoke directly to them. And because they're not here right now, I can at least tell you, for some of you that might be engaged in some form of ministry or another already, that there will be times that you're going to be discouraged. You're going to say, well, how, how are the numbers? Are people coming? Are they interested? How's the finances? You know, these are the, those things that the, the senior pastors worry about. You know, is, is the, are the bills being paid? Are the, the pews full? You know what? That's not your business. Now I speak to myself, okay? It's not your business, Pastor Paul. Your business is to be faithful to teach the word of God and tend the sheep, love the sheep. God is the one that gives the increase as he sees fit. God is the one that pays the bills as he sees fit. God is the one that fills up the pews or not as he sees fit. We are so culturally uh, accepting of the standards of the world that we've lost our way yet in another way. Do you know that John the Baptist would be considered a failure today? What? He had this wonderful ministry. Everything was working out fine for him. Multitudes of people are coming out. The next thing you know, the guy is, he makes a stupid tweet and he, and he, <laughs> and he ends up in jail. And so there he is in jail and he's so discouraged in jail that he sends his disciples to Jesus and says, should we look for another person? Are you not the guy? And of course, the Lord answers him biblically. The blind see, the lame walk, you decide. Again, giving him some thought time. And do you know that John the Baptist ended up with his head cut off? You'd say, well, that wasn't a very successful ministry. How about Jeremiah? God tells Jeremiah, go and prophesy to these people, and they won't listen. How's that? What? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to go fishing. I, why would I want to do that? Well, because I called you to do it. See, Let God be the judge of what is successful. Believe me, in the economy of God, Jeremiah was a successful prophet, as were many others. All of his own are successful because they are walking in obedience to the Lord. Simon, son of Jonah, Agape me more than your job? Agape me more than your money? Agape me more than the temporal benefits of this life? Candlelight? Do you agape? I suspect that if you're anything like me, you're gonna have to say, well, depending on where you are in your growth, well, Lord, you know that I phileo thee. I guarantee you that in the average church today, there's a lot more phileo than there is agape. I can tell that by the tithe box. Sorry. The last thing to get saved is your wallet. Well, because you're selfish, see? You don't, you're not gonna give. I'm gonna sacrificially give so that I can benefit the, the work of the ministry. I'm gonna keep the money for myself. Look, this sermon's not about money, but there is a barometer. There's, that's one. There's so many. And guys, let me tell you something. The Lord doesn't look at you and discourage you and say, well, look, you're not, you're not a tither. You're not giving the way you should. You shouldn't even come to church here. He never says that, and neither do we. We say, hey, come, everyone. You that are thirsty, drink. You who are hungry, eat. We trust the Lord with all the rest. Amen? And, and so I know that in the processes of our growth, God will grow us all as he sees fit. He lays on our hearts what we should do in our service to him, not to earn our salvation, not to be uh, ranked higher in the reward systems of the eternal, but just to be in him 
those persons that he has shaped us and molded us to be. Simon, son of Jonah, turn around. Go to Nineveh. Candlelight. Sort of stings. But it need not. Because the Lord did not discourage the discouraged. The Lord did not refuse the offering, the service of the one who loved insufficiently. The one that lost vision. The one that says, I don't want to do this anymore. He came along and encouraged and said, Peter, feed, tend my sheep. What's it like to be in the ministry? Let me tell you. Verse 18. Most assuredly, he says to Peter, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. Do you know that Peter, according to history, looked his wife in the eyes as an old man while his wife was being crucified in his presence. And he agaped her enough. He let her. Because he knew in the eternal value, this life is a vapor that appears for a moment and vanishes away. But oh, that will be glory. And he was able to encourage her. The history tells us that he read her or, or quoted her scriptures and sang to her while she was suffering and dying on a cross. And after she died, they crucified Peter. When you are old, they will stretch out your hands and lead you where you don't want to go. And Peter said, I'm not worthy to be crucified the way my Savior was crucified. Therefore, crucify me upside down. And history tells us that they did, in fact, crucify him upside down. What is the Lord telling Peter? Peter, if you obey me, you'll be wealthy. If you obey me, you'll be successful. If you obey me, everyone will like you. No. He's saying there's a cost to ministry. It's like when he told Paul the apostle, he said, um, show him how many things he must suffer for my name's sake. The ministry isn't always glorious. That's the Western view. The Western view is put your hand on the TV screen. Confess it, name it, claim it. You know, whatever it is you want, it's yours. No. That's this fat American method of, 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 of promulgating a false gospel of prosperity. But I'll tell you what is true. If you come with him, as Bonhoeffer once said, he bids you come and die. And believe me, that's agape. And I want to be the pastor to you. My wife wants to be the shepherd to these women in the, in the women's ministry. We, all of us on the staff, want to pour out our lives for you because we have agape for you. And it isn't the agape that we manufacture. It is the agape of the Holy Spirit at work in us. For I am, we are nothing. He is everything. And to him be the glory forever and ever. Amen? And so he says to Peter, when you're old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. And he spoke this signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to Peter, follow me. Same words he spoke when he first called him from his fishing boat where he had brought in a great draft of fish. And he said, Peter, from now on you will catch men. Follow me. And now, three, three and a half years later, he looks at this discouraged Peter and encourages him. He doesn't discourage the discouraged. 
He doesn't condemn those that are weak. He fans the flame. A smoldering flax he will not quench. That's what John the Baptist said about him. What does that mean? <laughs> He's going to keep blowing and just let that flame burn. And he blows in the wind, in, in his wind into our hearts. Amen? Amen. If this message has been a blessing, won't you please consider partnering with us? Send a financial gift of any size to Candlelight Fellowship, P.O. Box 2555, Hayden, Idaho, 83835. Join Pastor Paul Van Oy each Sunday and Wednesday for our online service or in person at 5725 North Pioneer Drive in beautiful Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. For service times and sermon recordings, visit candlelight.org.